Thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone uh, <coughs> to this uh, workshop, this which, as Miha has mentioned, is part of a project uh, that has been initiated by the, let's say, family of environmental partnership foundations, which operate in six Central European countries, that is Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania and Bulgaria. And together uh, we uh, were supported by the Euro for Citizens program and also included the Romanian Civil Society um, Development Foundation in this joint project, uh, which started uh, the, in, during autumn last year and will run until February uh, next year. And uh, the objective of uh, this project is twofold. Um, it aims to link local civic organizing, local, local civil societies to, a more, to the more broader national and European level. So we aimed at building the capacities of local organizations in advocacy, uh, participation, not only on the local but also more on the national uh, level, and also attempting to create links um, uh, in Central Europe and to work together uh, towards uh, developing uh, recommendations uh, for a policy that would help uh, civil society organizations to work uh, in the EU more efficiently and in a more uh, protected um, environment. Uh, as it was mentioned, uh, the project started uh, last autumn with the kickoff event. And as a first step in all six countries, we made a kind of mapping of local organizations that we have not yet been in contact with or uh, know, knew little about to survey their needs and the obstacles um, of uh, more um, active participation in local and uh, national uh, matters. Um, this is just... Uh, um, what I had at hand is the results from Hungary, so all around the country we have met with around uh, 90 organizations and made detailed interviews with them and tried to find those uh, that are open to cooperating uh, locally and nationally and are more interested in, in uh, building their own capacities as regards uh, participation and advocacy. And for these organizations that we have mapped in each of the participating countries, we have organized a series of uh, capacity building trainings on these uh, subjects uh, during the first uh, half of the year. But even in these uh, events, there has been input from all the different uh, Central European countries. So participants could learn not only what's happening in their own countries, but in the neighboring ones uh, as well. Um, we have also remained in, in touch or stayed in touch with the organizations involved in regular newsletters and uh, reading materials. And uh, the project kind of culminates in three international uh, workshops uh, that try to summarize and build on uh, the uh, earlier achievements or the earlier findings of the project. Uh, the first such event took place in Bulgaria last week. Now uh, we are at the second one, and the third one will be in Slovakia in Banska Bistrica at the end of November. And all of these events, and of course the communication and the work in between the events, uh, is geared towards developing uh, a set of recommendations for an EU level civil society policy or civil society strategy. And I would like to um, go into this um, policy or strategy for which by now we have a first draft document which we started discussing within the Environmental Partnership Foundations last week in Varna. Um, and we, uh, in the coming months, plan to gradually discuss it with more and more affected organizations both nationally uh, in the Central European countries, but also with uh, Europe-wide networks uh, and umbrellas. And why we, why we believe that we need to create or need to work towards uh, uh, an EU civil society policy? 
Uh, on one hand, uh, it goes without saying that uh, civil society organizations play an important role in upholding democracies and European values, but they need an enabling environment in order to perform these functions, to perform these roles. Uh, but at the same time, we also observe the trends of shrinking civil space uh, within U U European Union member states, particularly in Central Europe, but also elsewhere. So there is a kind of a contradiction that while civil society would be very important uh, on the European level, uh, its space, uh, its, its room to maneuver, uh, is shrinking or their uh, situation is becoming more and more difficult. Also, civil society affairs are largely member state competence, meaning that it's up to the member state how they regulate um, uh, civil society organizations in their own countries, what kind of working environment or operating conditions they create. Um, but recent studies have shown that civil society organizations in, especially in Central Europe, very much look at the EU as a supportive political partner or political actor, and also as a funder or a donor. So all these factors taken together to us uh, point very much in the direction uh, that uh, there needs to be um, an EU-level civil society policy setting out the main, let's say, cornerstones of how uh, this so-called enabling environment should be created across the continent or within the whole union. Because also uh, the, the current instruments that the EU has at its disposal in case uh, the um, general values and the general principles are breached uh, or, um, or if a member state is going again uh, against uh, democratic principles, so it has only a very limited set of instruments, and these are piecemeal in the sense that they can only address individual actions and not, let's say, the, the larger picture, picture so to say. Um, and actually, the EU also has um, civil society policies as regards its external affairs towards third countries, uh, where it, to which it provides development support. There it created uh, civil society policies or strategies, but it lacks, lacks uh, such an instrument for within uh, the Union. Um, so, um, in this uh, draft paper, which is the very first draft which is available at the legislation desk, uh, we have tried to outline some of the key elements uh, of this uh, possible civil society strategy, which is now up for discussion and commenting. So what could be these main elements? Uh, the first is to develop kind of a guidance uh, on minimum standard of civic freedoms. So basically a guideline for member states what they should do and what they should not do, what they refrain from doing in order uh, to create this so-called enabling environment for civil societies. Um, and this basically only means, I mean, there are international law instruments out there uh, that guarantee these civic freedoms, such as the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, but how uh, these should be interpreted, uh, could, it, it would be useful to create better guidance. Um, and there are, um, it's again uh, not an original piece of work, but uh, there are some guidances by other international organizations which focus on these uh, seven areas. So the freedom to create organizations, uh, the freedom to operate freely without uh, state interference, uh, the right to free expression, the right to cooperate on cooperation and communication among civil society, and between civil society and, let's say, state actors or businesses. Um, the right for, to uh, peaceful um, assembly, the right to seek resources without limitations or stigmatizations, and the state has a duty pro to, pro to protect. So we propose that these seven principles should be a bit better interpreted and explained how this could be applied and how this should be applied in practice towards uh, civil society. 
Um, of course, uh, this interpretation or guidelines should be uh, linked, uh, <coughs> coupled with monitoring and, let's say, whistleblowing um, procedures. So, uh, such a civil society policy could also include an obligation uh, to survey the state of civil societies regularly within the EU. For example, the EU's Fundamental Rights Agency made such a survey which was published in early 2018. Uh, however, this should be done annually or biannually to be, in order to be able to pinpoint new developments um, and trends. Um, and this monitoring should go to the highest, higher levels of the EU. Uh, should be discussed in the Parliament uh, and other, uh, I mean the European Parliament and other relevant uh, EU institutions. And in case uh, there are breaches uh, of um, of the principles, or a member state goes against these principles, there should be some kind of a flagging or uh, whistleblowing mechanism. For example, through the European uh, Ombudsman, but that's only a one possibility. Um, Many other organizations, not only us, I mean, all this work builds on earlier work by other international organizations as well, but just tries to create a more comprehensive set of uh, recommendations. One other recommendation that uh, comes up times and time and again is uh, a more structured dialogue uh, between civil society organizations and the EU institutions directly, which includes the Parliament, the Commissioners, <coughs> the European Commission itself, uh, the presidencies, um, etc. And uh, um, what we propose is to create a kind of um, guidance on the structure uh, <coughs> of this uh, dialogue, meaning who, when, how often, with whom, how organizations can access uh, dialogue, so a bit more um, uh, kind of a timetable and a roadmap for such a uh, dialogue should be developed in order to take it uh, seriously. Um, civic education is a further uh, important factor, though it doesn't, it's not about civil society per se, uh, but uh, we believe that without people uh, who are aware and understand what it, what it what democracy is about <clears throat> and have been raised or educated um, to uh, respect the values of democracy. Um, so such uh, citizenry uh, is a precondition of having an active civil society. Uh, and conversely, civil society organizations play an important role in educating the future generations to become uh, socially aware uh, democratic citizens. So therefore, civic education, citizen education, is a very important role uh, in um, uh, strengthening uh, civil society. Um, and we see that um, the education systems of the different member states are very divergent in this respect. So they, um, the, the style and the level of citizen education is very different. And here again, we, we think that some minimum guidance or minimum standards of what it means uh, to provide citizen education in each of the member states could be developed. Again, it's not something that uh, has to be figured out from scratch. For example, the Council of Europe has a specific charter on civic education that uh, could form the basis of such uh, minimum standards. Um, another long-standing issue that has been talked about a lot is to create some kind of a European civil society organization form, which is particularly is even more important uh, these days of shrinking civil space, when in some member states, some organizations, the very existence of some organizations is under threat. So this could be either a kind of a European uh, foundation or association uh, form, um, or, or a registered European foundation or association, uh, or uh, through recognizing uh, civil society organizations in countries other than their own. Again, it's something that there is a Council of Europe Convention for, but it's very little applied. 
and uh, in the worst case, develop ways on, or means uh, that enable um, relocation of a civil society organization in case it's necessary because the organization's very existence is threatened. Um, another recommendation is to strengthen the so-called third group of the um, European Economic and Social Committee, sorry, it should be Committee, not Council, which is an important consultative body in the EU where civil society is directly represented. But the way how these civic, civil society representatives are delegated by the member state governments is again not uniform, it's very divergent. In some countries, uh, the delegates are kind of hand-picked by their own governments. In other countries, more transparent uh, uh, selection or delegation mechanisms are used. Again, it's something uh, where minimum standards could be developed that guarantee a transparent and participatory delegation of these uh, members uh, of the EESC in order to guarantee that they are truly coming from civil society and represent the, the interest and, and the, um, uh, yeah, the interest of, of civil society. Um, another related issue, I mean, it's another not directly civil society issue, but very much related uh, to how civil society is viewed in the countries, how civil society can uh, promote its message uh, and build its image is media independence. And in this respect, uh, unbiased reporting of CSOs uh, would be uh, very important, um, which could be achieved, for example, through an amendment of uh, the relevant EU directive, though that has kind of limited possibilities because, again, media is something very much a member state uh, competence. Um, the EU could also uh, encourage participation on lower levels as well. For example, um, uh, during the approval of the national uh, public budget, um, there could be requirements for public participation. In procurement rules, um, participation of CSOs could be encouraged, etc. Uh, so there are possibilities stemming from the common market and um, from the single market in the EU that can help um, uh, CSO, civil society participation at lower levels as well. Anti-money laundering rules is something very current uh, in the EU and here the problem is that um, the discriminatory applic uh, application or implementation of um, anti-terrorist financing and anti-money laundering rules can um, negatively affect civil society or some member states can basically abuse these rules to restrict uh, the free fundraising and the free operation of civil society organizations. There is an international expert working group of civil society organizations on this um, and here it's here our proposal is just simply to listen to these, uh, this working group, these experts, uh, when the EU uh, works on its anti or the implementation of its money laundering um, legislation. And last but not least, of course, is always funding uh, the money. Um, it, um, what we, uh, the proposal uh, says that uh, EU institutions, particularly, of course, the Commission, uh, should do more uh, to directly support civil society organizations, especially in countries uh, which are affected by restrictions and shrinking civil space. Uh, a very good step in the direction is the so-called Rights and Values Program, which is a proposal for the next uh, EU budget um, that would uh, support um, organizations working on upholding European values and strengthening European uh, democracy. And according to the current <coughs> proposals, um, this new program should provide better <coughs> access to local and national NGOs besides European networks. So it should provide support uh, to organizations working on, on lower levels as well. However, uh, at this point, it's only uh, a proposal, and of course.
course, uh, when it comes to money, uh, the devil is always in the details, meaning uh, that the procedures for disseminating um, <coughs> this program, the funds of this program, uh, are very important um, when we talk about how and which organizations uh, will benefit. So, we propose uh, that procedures should allow uh, such a, the procedure should be made in a way that they allow uh, participation of smaller organizations uh, as well. So basically, this is the very first set of recommendations and here I also should mention uh, that um, um, this builds on earlier work done by many other organizations and we plan to work together with those organizations in the future as well. And of course, uh, it will be a very long-term uh, effort uh, to make such a recommendations into something uh, official EU paper or official EU document. And of course, it's a very it's an open question whether it will be possible at all. But we believe that we should start working in these uh, directions in order to counter the trend of shrinking civil space. Uh, in the EU as well. So that was the whole project and the proposals very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. And if you please stay here for our questions and questions.